Um, basically, what I'm dealing with is the notion that the original resistance, the heart of the resistance, really, uh, lay not in London in the summer of 1940, but in editorial Africa and Cameroon. And it's a somewhat provocative argument, but I do think uh, geopolitically, in terms of natural resources, even in terms of number of fighting men, Free France between 1940 and 1943 rested far more on Central Africa than is commonly known, or is, for that matter, really known at all. Um, so what you see on this on this uh, poster here, uh, introducing my talk, is General de Gaulle, of course, in colonial attire, which is not what we're used to seeing him in. Uh, and next to him, naturally, Félix Égoué. Uh, now, Félix Égoué, uh, quite a bit has actually been written on Félix Égoué. Uh, Brian Weinstein's memoir, uh, uh, biography, sorry, uh, remains, uh, to my eye, the best uh, available biography. There's been at least five devoted to him. Uh, and we do know the role that Égoué played in the summer of 1940, rallying uh, Chad over to General de Gaulle, to be specific. Um, this uh, started what's been known as the Trois Glorieuses States, the Trois Glorieuses, in homage, of course, to the revolution of the 19th century, that swung over a vast swath of Africa uh, to General de Gaulle. But what I, what I see in the historiography, or what I saw starting this project, was quite a bit on that moment of 26th, 27th, and 28th of August 1940, quite a bit on the Brazzaville Conference of 1944, and very little on what happened in Central Africa and Free French Africa in between those two dates. And that's very much uh, what I tried to address with this project. Um, so first of all, what territories are we talking about? Well, first of all, we have to situate this in the context of a Franco-French imperial civil war. Um, and remember that the territories that went over to General de Gaulle in the end of August 1940 are those in, what would you call that, the rust color there in the middle, which is to say uh, French Mandate Cameroon and Afrique Équatoriale Française, uh, so modern-day uh, Gabon, uh, Central African Republic, uh, Republic of Congo, uh, and uh, what am I here? Uh, Chad. Um, those uh, were the ones that rallied General de Gaulle in August 1940. And when I say rallied General de Gaulle, that's a little bit of a euphemism, uh, because as I think I show in the book, really uh, that decision hinged on very few people. Populations were not consulted. There was no referendum. There wasn't even a referendum amongst the tiny settler population. Really, it's an extraordinary story of a kind of synergy between a few forces on the inside and a few forces on the outside. Some of those forces on the inside, incidentally, some of the most consequential and important were African. I want to return to that in a second. Um, so here are the territories that swung over to General de Gaulle in 1940. And one of the points that I try to make in the introduction is that without these territories, de Gaulle really would have been a kind of king without any sort of territory, right? Carlton Gardens was all nice and well, but as Jean-Luc Couture said, he was something of a squatter on the shores of the Thames. Uh, until uh, the fateful days of late August 1940, when these territories went over to him. Now, to be sure, the New Hebrides, the tiny New Hebrides, uh, rallied first, and there were, of course, the territories of the South Pacific that were very important. But in terms of natural resources, in terms of rubber, gold, and men, really, it's the areas that we're looking at here that proved absolutely uh, pivotal. Notice as well the strategic importance of these territories. First of all, going back to this map, uh, the border between AOF and AOF equatorial in West Africa, uh, was the only land border between two now sworn enemies, which is to say the France of Pétain and the France of General de Gaulle. Right? It was an actual ligne de front. And the other interesting ligne de front here is between Libya and Chad. And very quickly, as early as early 1941, uh, the Free French are going to take the attack uh, to the southern vulnerable uh, flank of Mussolini's Libya. So this is in part a military story, in part a story of resources, and in part, of course, a story of sort of African ownership of this resistance, which I think needs to be told. So part of that involves retrieving African voices, and I confess that I did not uh, undertake a series of interviews. I won't go into them, the rationale for that I could during question period. Uh, one of the most obvious problems being that an NCO in the Free French would now be, what, an average 98 years old. Um, but beyond that, I also found a great many African voices in the archives, and specifically uh, in archives like the one that you're looking at here. Unfortunately, these archives have now moved, but when I consulted them in 2010, uh, this is what the Archive National de la République du Congo looked like in Brazzaville. They moved because there was a, a giant hole in the roof caused by the, the Civil War of 1997. 
um, and they're now non-consultable. So there's a whole subplot to the archives behind this, this project. Uh, but I did want to say that the archives that I found, uh, that I used in, in Brazzaville and in Yaoundé proved to be essential for this project, so too for the French colonial archives in Aix-en-Provence. Um, so here you have the cast of characters at the summit. Uh, Ibwe is showing uh, De Gaulle the troops. Here you have a, a sort of testimonial to those incredible uh, heady days of late August uh, 1940 when Cameroon went over to uh, General de Gaulle on the 27th of August, Chad had gone over on the 26th, and Congo was about to go over on the 28th of August. It also shows the degree of bricolage at work here. You see, Le Cameroon proclaims son indépendance politique et économique. Cameroon proclaims its economic and political independence. That's a, that's a pregnant phrase. It's a, a phrase that's pregnant with meaning at the very least. And I'm not sure Colonel de Clare, as he was then known, necessarily thought through all of the consequences of such a phrase. Uh, declaring martial law, uh, also uh, uh, a bold move as well. But notice as well, if you just have a chance to peruse this, uh, l'assurance de la reprise de la vie économique is put forward as the main cause of rallying Great Britain in 1940, which sort of, you know, is slightly less glorious a cause than we think back on uh, when we look at the events of late August. I don't have time to go into it, but there's a whole commemorative dimension to this project. This is a, a plaque in Yaoundé marking the rallying of uh, Cameroon over to General de Gaulle. Now, I mentioned the role of Africans. Um, it was really multi-form. I'm going to go into the number of troops, and I can't dwell too long on any uh, facet, but huge numbers of troops. Of the roughly 70,000 free French in 1943, approximately 27,000 hailed from French Equatorial Africa in Cameroon, which is I think a very important proportion and, and probably redefines the way we look at the early Free French fighters. Um, here you have a Free French, well, a, a unit in uh, Congo, in Brazzaville, orchestrating the actual swinging over, the actual regime change on the 27th of August 1940, taking General Cusson by force. Cusson is being thrown on board this vehicle and he's going to be carted over to a boat, which in turn is going to send him over to the Belgian. So this is the actual uh, moment of rupture, if you will, uh, in uh, August of 1940. A great deal of bricolage and creativity was involved here. Uh, de Gaulle was unknown to the vast majority of French people, let alone Africans. And the very first street name to General de Gaulle did not go up somewhere in France, but it went up in Yaoundé. Here it is. This is the actual plaque preserved today, interestingly, in Paris at the Musée de la Libération. Uh, but notice the afterthoughts. Uh, the person who did it didn't know initially that de Gaulle took two L's and had to <laughs> go back and correct their mistake, right? So uh, sort of resoundingly clear that de Gaulle wasn't the known figure that he is today. And part of this effort then was an effort to proselytize amongst Africans uh, and spread the word of Gaullism. So that proselytizing took place by various means. The more high-tech means involved radio. This is the mouthpiece of the new regime. Any regime that seeks legitimacy needs a currency, needs an official radio station. Uh, the Free French would elaborate all of the above. Uh, and this is the old headquarters of Radio uh, Brazzaville that I had photographed uh, four years ago, now seemingly rather derelict. Uh, and these are, amusingly, a couple of uh, logos that Disney uh, designed for Radio Brazzaville. Um, I don't know if either of them were actually used, but you can see, I'm not sure the lighting is great on my slide, but on, on one side a ferocious lion, and on the other side a rather tender looking giraffe uh, operating radio equipment. The process of legitimization also, of course, rested upon Africans, and uh, in 1943, uh, um, a collective work was published in Brazzaville, uh, whose profits were intended for the war effort, and this is its frontispiece, showing, as I describe in the book, two African warriors surrounding the Gaullist cross of Lorraine, appropriating it, claiming ownership of it in a way. Now, I say that the war effort rested largely on the shoulders of Africans. Uh, part of the story that I tell in the book is that this effort was sometimes consented with proper engagement forms into the army, sometimes less so, and sometimes the line was rather blurry, like in these uh, warlike activities that were being implemented in the Cameroonian school system in 1941. This is actually a, a photograph from George Roger, the famous Magnum photographer, showing what he called 
children playing at war, I really think, um, given their hats and given a variety of other things, including the cross of the land that they're carrying, this is actually a full-fledged school activity. Recruitment was quite intense in territories, which I should add, were, had not been sort of at the, at the heart of the previous war's recruitment thrust, right? French troops in the Great War uh, in the colonies tended to be recruited from West Africa rather than Equatorial Africa. So this was a brand new effort in a sense. Um, and uh, it was a very intense one indeed. These figures shown here total roughly 17,000. To those numbers, you have to add roughly 10,000 troops that were already on FEA soil, French Equatorial African soil, uh, in 1940, which, come, which gives you the, the figure that I, that I gave. So notice that the recruitment is most intense in Chad and Mboki Shari, modern day uh, Chad and Central African Republic. Broadly speaking, to summarize 400 pages in one, in one catchphrase, I would argue that uh, the military recruitment was most intense in the north of the Federation of French Equatorial Africa, and the resource extraction was more intense in the south, rubber and gold especially. So you have two forms of sacrifice uh, in this era. The recruitment of these soldiers was done uh, wholesale, very quickly in some cases. Notice that uh, a great many of the troops do not yet have footwear that would only arrive in late 41, early 42 in some cases. It was also a tradition of many Tihaya units not to provide footwear to their troops, especially in training, which you see here. And of course, the, the actual accomplishments of these units are something that I pay close attention to in one of my chapters. Uh, this is one of the most famous early battles of the Free French. Notice we're not dealing with the Battle of Stalingrad, right? This is several hundred men on each side. What interests me, though, is not so much the question of scale, it's the question of percentages, right? So the Battle of Kufra has gone down in history as the first Free French victory against the Axis to have left from Free French soil. Uh, and you have uh, the amazing crossing of the desert, the Sahara, from south to north, orchestrated by Leclerc's men. This has become almost mythological. There are cartoons devoted to it. There are hymns in the French army devoted to it. What isn't so known about Kufra is that 295 sub-Saharan Africans were in the campaign versus 101 European troops. This was, again, a heavily African effort. Uh, much the same could be said of the subsequent campaign in the Fezzan, where, again, Mussolini's troops were routed by the Free French, this time in the other side, in the western side of uh, the Libyan desert. There, the proportion was 2,700 2, African troops for 550 European troops. Now, by waging war on Mussolini's Libya, the Free French were accomplishing several things. First of all, Charles de Gaulle was taking ownership of the war effort and showing that he could do something to the Allies. But beyond that, there was also an attempt to try to rally troops that had remained loyal to Vichy. French, Free French intelligence suggested that if uh, Free French units could defeat the Italians, especially when they were outgunned, like at a place like in Fezzan and at Kufra, then a great many sort of Vichyites on the fence might go over to the Free French. And there were elaborate, you know, sort of feelers sent uh, to Niger uh, because, of course, the operation took place at the Chad Libyan border, very close to the border of Niger. All of this came to naught, right? The Kufra was taken uh, boldly by this free French column uh, and encircling movements. Uh, the French, as I said, were on paper outgunned. But the long and the short of it is that the Vichyites did not go over in droves. As Jean-François Jean Murassiol has shown, there is a kind of big uh, hiatus between Dakar and 1943, during which the free French really had a hard time recruiting outside of now, these are sort of moyens de fortune. A great deal of improvisation was going into this militarily as well before 1943 when the Free French are finally outfitted with British and American weaponry and uniforms. Uh, notice some of the vehicles being used at the Battle of Kufra. So you have this Chevrolet armed with what looks like a fairly rudimentary piece of ammunition and African troops on the vehicle. This is a wonderful George Roger uh, picture showing the pitfalls and the perils of the desert. Again, a free French African troop uh, on uh, his crossing of the Sahara. Here you have another Roger picture showing the actual uh, loading of seized weaponry from the Italians at Kufra. So one of the not inconsequential stories of, of Kufra is that the free French basically were to use that ammunition for the next two years. 
Um, it turned out to be an incredible coup for them. When I talk about the African War, I thought I shouldn't neglect the auxiliaries, translators, uh, people sewing equipment, people building uniforms, people building tents, and also especially the drivers who risked their lives in this incredible Sahara campaign. Uh, the drivers and also, uh, to some extent, uh, the navigators who went up the Congo River uh, and then the equipment would follow its way up through the Sahara. One of the points of the book is to show that really this free French movement is unique insofar as it really was a kind of arrow from south to north. This liberating thrust begins in Central Africa, winds its way through the Sahara, accumulates these victories, or even heroic defeats, right? Birakem is not a victory, but Rommel has to you know, divert around the free French. And then finally, uh, the landings in Italy and uh, France. Here again, free French African troops training at Guar. Now, this was not um, an army without difficulties. I go into some detail on some of the inequalities in diet, in rank, in pay. And uh, these inequalities are uh, nicely foregrounded here by the fact that the famous BM2 that fights so heroically against Rommel at Biagen, when its NCOs uh, pose for a photographer, they do so in two separate blocks, the white NCOs above and the black NCOs below. One of the subplots of my story is that there was a kind of glass ceiling for African NCOs. I suppose it's not altogether surprising in itself. Much could be said of the same. Uh, much the same could be said of the British Army at the time. Here you have African troops leaving for the front. I don't. I think I'm going to cut ahead quite a bit and talk a little bit about um, the fate of Africans on the home front in Equatorial Africa. So one of the treasure troves that I found in, in Brazzaville were these letters of complaint to the administration, and a lot of these letters used the language of the Free French and turned it against them. Um, so here is a, a letter of complaint directly to the summit from a Gabonese village to Félix Eboué, saying, quote, the local commandant treats us badly, he jails us for eight days, 15 days or two months, whips us 50 times a day, to him a black person is a monkey, he calls us monkeys, we're not allowed to speak back to whites. Of course, this letter is being formulated to the black governor of free French Africa, right? And in the next letter, you have very clearly an articulation that is in line with the language of Free France. We, the inhabitants of Lombardy, draw the following to your attention. Our new administrator, M. Duverger, is not a true Frenchman. And he's a Vichy man. His job is to jail us blacks. If he were a true Gaullist, he would not make blacks suffer simply because they wish to work for de Gaulle. You can imagine a person reading this letter in Brazzaville leaping out of their chair. Um, and this really is the sort of letter that underscores the hypocrisy of a free French effort that is fighting at least partly in the name of democracy and anti-racism, and which at, at its core has these fundamental abuses going on in Central Africa. I wanted to mention very briefly the importance of natural resources. The rubber from Free French Africa is probably what makes this area most important from Winston Churchill's standpoint. Um, not because these figures are large in and of themselves. Notice Sri Lanka next to Free French Africa. But because latex has become so precious by 1942 in the wake of the Japanese onslaught across Southeast Asia. So, uh, all of a sudden, the British, the, the Americans, are knocking on the wall's door, saying, we desperately need whatever rubber you can get us. And the, the sub-story there is you can't just turn around and produce plantation rubber overnight. The only rubber plants take five years to mature. The only rubber you can just pick up overnight is wild rubber. And that wild rubber takes an incredible toll in its collection. I don't have time to read this remarkable testimony from uh, Germain Kuhl, a free French photographer of German origin and a free French rank, but I do want to show her pictures. This is a, a Congolese woman bringing wild rubber to the market, and in her passage, Germain Kuhl underscores the forlorn expression on this uh, woman's face. These are uh, inhabitants, again, of the, of the Congo bringing wild rubber to the authorities. Uh, this is a Library of Congress photo showing much the same thing. We're in the Free French Congo, just across from the former Belgian Congo, and populations are being given quotas. Uh, you have to bring so much rubber by such and such a day. That said, rubber is also you know, a relatively lucrative crop for a lot of these populations. So there's a, a kind of two-edged sword that I described in 
Here you have the rubber being weighed um, by a colonial official, uh, the white guy in the helmet on the left. Uh, here you have uh, Africans basically being told that now with this money you can buy something. Little shops are set up right outside of the market. And what can they buy? Well, through lend lease, they can buy made in America cigarettes, shown here, made in America finished goods, and of course they can be exposed to images of flying fortresses and other American propaganda. There's a low grade propaganda war being waged here. Uh, you have images of Roosevelt, but not the slightest image of uh, De Gaulle. This is perhaps my favorite image in the book. Um, this is a picture, again, by this remarkable free French photographer, Germain Poul, uh, German communist avant-garde photographer who ends up volunteering for the free French. Uh, she took this in modern, well, in modern-day Central African Republic, then called Poulongi Chari, and she called it simply paintings on a house. I'm persuaded that this painting on a house shows the collection of wild rubber from an African standpoint, with the collection by women, children, and men on the left, the truck in the middle, which I actually showed you at the market a minute, a minute ago, very same kind of truck, and then on the right, the authorities handing out money and uh, weighing uh, the rubber as well. Um, just a very quick word on gold to say that that is the other major uh, importance of Free French Africa in Gaullist eyes. The, the goal is to make Free France more economically autonomous. Uh, here you have uh, Africans toiling in a gold mine in uh, the Congo, and here you have the supplying of said gold mine by other uh, porters. And some of that gold would end up in Free French coffers. This particular, most of this gold would end up in Free French coffers. This particular nugget has an incredible story. It, it was extracted by uh, a Congolese miner. Uh, the Belgian who runs the mine said immediately when he saw it, my God, it looks like Africa. We have to give it to General de Gaulle. Um, and uh, somebody along the way pronounced that it's, it's all the more fortuitous because it looks like Africa, but the Horn of Africa isn't there, and that Horn of Africa happened to be at least partially in Italian hands. So it sort of materialized the contribution of free French Africa in its very stone. I think I will leave it at that, and with these two images, uh, those, these photos that I took in uh, Brazzaville myself, showing some of the local uh, memories of this episode, which I think is not, uh, or has not, really been, been told much to now. Thank you very much. I, I enjoyed reading this book enormously. I don't see what's wrong with a literal, with a literal translation of the title. Free France was Africa. In the first couple of years, in a very real sense, uh, it, it was. And I, 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 I had a vague sense of this. Uh, how important um, having his own African territory was for establishing the world's legitimacy. And it's absolutely wonderful to have it uh, spelled out in, uh, so fully in this book with all the ambiguities involved because uh, the book makes it very clear, the one, you didn't say too much about this, but it's very clear the book there's a great deal of coercion involved in raising the troops and in uh, gathering uh, the rubber and the goal, while at the same time the language is a language of, uh, of liberation. <clears throat> and the, 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 the symbolic the importance of this real estate, <coughs> the goal, is, is, is absolutely uh, enormous. Uh, the goal found himself uh, in the late summer of 1940, a squatter on the, on the banks of the Thames. It was absolutely indispensable for him to have some bit of French territory that recognized his authority. The Vichy, uh, the Vichy government had condemned him to death, uh, and Vichy propaganda was saying that uh, this person is simply, uh, not only is he a rebellious general, disobedient general, but he's, uh, he's, uh, he's, he's helping the British take over our empire. And this was very powerful propaganda. So in September 1940, the Gaulle set off uh, with some, some British ships and, and a few uh, soldiers to appear before Dakar and to try to persuade the authorities in Dakar to uh, join the Free French Movement. Uh, this is, you alluded to Dakar, I, the, I, the importance of this cannot be overestimated. Uh, uh, and they sent in uh, an emissary in a small boat and the authorities in Dakar opened fire and the goal and uh, the British ships had to beat a retreat. Absolutely humiliating 
uh, defeat, uh, De Gaulle was usually considered suicide. Uh, this clearly uh, affected the unwillingness of the United States to recognize free France for the next three years. Uh, and uh, the, the Vichy authorities crowed about it. Uh, they they uh, had films of it sent to Hitler. Hitler saw the films. Uh, he was enormously impressed by the ability of the Vichy regime to defend its own territory, upon which the Vichy uh, uh, regime was able to organize a, a bargain with Hitler, whereby uh, uh, the German uh, Armistice Commission permitted a huge increase of armaments for Africa, including tanks, which were forbidden in the mainland, uh, because they understood that the, the, the Vichy France would defend their African territories, not only against the British, but against the Gaulists. Uh, and so uh, the defeat at Dakar was absolutely overwhelming. Uh, this was an enormous symbolic importance to both sides, and the Gaulle simply had to have some real estate. So uh, in the, um, uh, what he had in, in, uh, in Equatorial Africa was, uh, was absolutely central. And um, uh, Aaron Jennings has made all this uh, wonderfully clear, uh, along with all the ambiguities involved, because uh, there was a great deal of constraint in the African contribution. One doesn't deny the, the, the voluntary side of it, um, but the constraint was, uh, was, was very present, perhaps even predominant, which uh, conflicted with the language of liberation in which uh, the initial propaganda was conducted. <coughs> now, uh, I suppose this is a professional deformation, but I want to talk for a minute or two about Vichy France, because uh, Vichy France also had a, a program for its colonies. The colonies were not only very important uh, as a, a, a source of resources for the French metropole and as a demonstration of the legitimacy of the Vichy regime, but um, uh, Vichy was determined to apply its national revolution to the colonies. And so you have the anti-Jewish statutes being, uh, being uh, uh, applied uh, literally and thoroughly throughout the empire to the 30 so or so Jews of Madagascar, for example. Uh, although the Jews had absolutely no interest in this whatsoever, it's a brilliant uh, uh, indication of the view that Vichy's domestic program was absolutely indigenous and absolutely autonomous. Uh, and so uh, both sides are trying to do something with the empire. I, I would be willing to, to bet, this is perhaps hazardous, that uh, Vichy was more active in uh, making changes in the internal administration and so forth in the Free French. The Free French seemed to me was so um, uh, focused upon getting soldiers and getting material that, that even though they talked a bit about using less forced labor and so forth, they didn't really do much about it. Uh, these she actually made forced labor worse because they were busy trying to set up institutions um, uh, that would uh, uh, correspond to the return to the soil and uh, the return to traditional institutions that we should be to, to institute. Um, anyway, that, that, that makes an interesting parallel of the, the perhaps um, further extension of what uh, Jennings has done. Now, uh, there are certainly allusions to this in the book, but one would have, might have wished for more, and that, that is one would like to fit the story into the narrative of decolonization. Uh, and uh, it's quite clear that uh, you start to look that way, it's clear that it's there. Uh, and, uh, uh, but it's not a simple uh, one, uh, one element narrative because uh, uh, the Free French uh, came out of this um, feeling that the empire uh, had never been more important to French survival and to French revival. Uh, and so the, the, the narrative involving French equatorial Africa, I think, is probably different. We should suggest this is different from the, from the uh, decolonization narrative of other empires, the Dutch, the Belgian, the Belgian, the British, where uh, the home countries <coughs> were not necessarily uh, reinforced in their determination to keep the empire, whereas the French, both the Vichy people and the Free French people, tended to feel uh, in 1945 that Africa had been, uh, the empire in general, had been uh, utterly and vitally essential to the very existence of France, which made decolonization much more difficult. So, on the one hand, you have 
factors that uh, encourage the development of independent movements, such as the humiliation of the French army, which certainly put a dent in the, in the, um, in the deference that they were supposed to, to, to owe to, to, to the mother country, uh, along with the, the grievances that are, are present because of the, of the, of the rather harsh conditions of extracting resources and uh, conscripting soldiers drivers and so forth. Uh, and uh, on the other side, you have all this language of, of liberation, a part of the post-war propaganda. Um, I, I, would, I would like to know more really about the, about the presence or not presence of, of independence movements within these areas. And, uh, in French equatorial Africa was the least developed of the African problem. And uh, it may well be that uh, lag behind in that respect as well. Um, now, um, the, the, the effects of, of the war in French Equatorial Africa in many cases were, were, were un unanticipated side effects. Uh, we saw the people being paid cash for the rubber, uh, being uh, able to buy uh, consumer goods, uh, and so one wants to ask what the effects upon African society and the African economy and African culture were of this, uh, of this rather intense uh, mobilization from the uh, And the, the, the ADF uh, had been uh, said that uh, maybe the case is one of the least developed parts of the empire. And certainly there seems to be some very rapid development going on here. I'm sure that's the side effect, the one that I suspect that the three French leaders didn't take any water at all participate. The individuals involved, and this is the tale on this book, were often uh, extremely reactionary. Uh, De La Mina certainly was a uh, racist and uh, uh, a firm believer that France did not come back to democracy in 1945 because they made such a mess of it in, uh, in the late 1930s. Uh, Leclerc, whose real name was De Gaulle's clock, uh, the descendant of an ancient noble family was uh, wildly reactionary. Um, and so it's there. But they were able to bring all this <coughs> together in a, a rather effective uh, war. It, it, it's quite an extraordinary uh, achievement. I think only uh, the, the, the ideal of an action being able to, uh, to bring the war home to the action held together mm -hmm. in probable coalition. Uh, when they took Kufra, uh, all 400 of them, uh, uh, the players uh, 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 had the, oh, sorry, uh, the player uh, had all of them swear an oath. But they would not uh, stop fighting until they had liberated Strasbourg Cathedral. And so part of the, part of the symbolism of this, and this is still talked all the time, be in France very long before somebody comes to the I want to read the oath that the player took. And the player had everybody swear that they would not uh, lay down their arms until they had liberated Strasbourg Cathedral. So Kufra is uh, just wildly um, emotional as a, as a symbol. Um, uh, I'll make just some, some, some final remarks about the, uh, the proportions we saw between the African. Uh, soldiers and troops and the uh, European soldiers and troops. At the very beginning, of course, uh, there are not very many Europeans. Uh, the Africans are greatly predominant. And one of the interesting things in the book that Eric James didn't get a chance to talk about was the uh, increasing whitening of the Free French force. Um, uh, partly by accident, but uh, partly deliberate as well. Uh, there's a whitening as you go up the ranks. Uh, there are only a few officers, a handful of officers, uh, a fair number of NCOs, but uh, not uh, as many ranks as there could have been. So there, there is a whitening uh, of rank, but there's simply whitening of numbers. And, and when, after the Americans landed in North Africa in November 1942, and the Vichy army in North Africa became uh, the principal force that uh, was going to be able to be used in the Italy campaign and in the landing in August 1944 in Provence. Uh, not the 
free French soldiers, but the former BC soldiers, who, uh, and there was considerable tension between them, uh, then uh, those forces were largely West African and North African, so uh, there's still a very large African contingent. But uh, there's increasing uh, whitening as you go along, and the, 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 that army was the basis of the French army that fought in Italy extremely well, by the way. Uh, the most, generally considered the most effective Allied uh, troops in, in, in Italy, although uh, what the soldiers did to the civilians, particularly the civilian women, uh, was a matter of considerable uh, difficulty. Uh, unfortunately, then there were, there were a great deal of publicity about this, unfortunately. Uh, but uh, when the uh, time came for uh, the landing in Africa, uh, the, the landing in southern France, excuse me, there was a, a policy of, of, of whitening. And when you reach the final the culminating moment when the Beau walks down the Champs Elysees, everybody's white. And there's a story, and I cannot tell you whether it's an accurate story or not, uh, whether it's true, whether it's, uh, whether it's an, uh, this is what the French call it. They move as long as uh, uh, that uh, Eisenhower staff, uh, General Walter B. Smith in particular, said that you will not parade down the Champs Elysees with black troops, and you've got to have white troops. So when you see pictures of the Gaulle walking down the Champs Elysees, right in back of him is a tank with a Spanish name, which is sort of odd. But they're all Spanish, the volunteers from the uh, refugees from the Spanish Civil War, a, a group called La Nueve, the ninth. The ninth battalion, the ninth something or the Land Wave, uh, formidable fighters, very angry uh, at uh, Franco and uh, thrilled to be uh, fighting him. And they are behind the goal coming down the Champs Elysees. Now, there not, none of the ADF or Cameroon soldiers are there that parade, as far as I know. Yep, you're right. And uh, that was an American decision, I'm told. I may have to write it, but that's the rumor that goes around. But there's a great deal of this process had already gone. So I'll, uh, I'll stop there. Eric Jennings' analysis is much more complicated and more interesting than him in praise of AF's contribution to the liberation of France. The story tells us a lot about what a colonial situation really is. As Eric says, while free France was Africa, Africa was anything but free. One could add that free France was colonial. The actions that led AF to joining the Free French were carried out by a very small band of administrators, opposed by another small brand of, band of administrators, who came from pretty much the same milieu uh, and were not necessarily uh, any more racist than the first category, with the, with the exception of Felix Edway, who was black. Uh, it's what we're talking about in the, the, the uh, process, in the, in the Trois was certainly not a, uh, a movement of, of uh, a popular movement, hardly a movement of liberation. Uh, many colonel would have rather gone the other way. Africans would bear the brunt of the struggle and would afterward be cited for their loyalty. But the movement was not there to, to direct, as, as, as Eric makes absolutely clear. Uh, he points in the, in, the, in the book to a mini war fought in Gabon which could have gone either way. This is a very contingent set of events that have been being described uh, here. And of course, it is quite striking how few people could take decisive action in a group of colonies this vast and that their actions would be effective. After all, AOF, in many ways, a similar kind of place, certainly the neighboring countries like Niger, uh, went in the other direction. The idea that France's honor and the, re and the reality of its existence was saved by its equatorial African colonies had become, for a time, an element in post-war mythologizing, but also an arc argument for some sort of recognition of the place of colonial subjects in post-war France. As one of the relatively few figures of in favor of progressive colonialism, in his book, Eric talks about Henri Laurenti, uh, but didn't, didn't mention uh, him in today's talk. But the, the, the uh, one rather similar figure in the French uh, administration, Robert de la Vignette, put it just after the war, France doesn't have an empire. France is an empire. The distinction is underscored during the war years in Eric's text. 
of was France. It was not simply a possession of France. The argument would become, by 1945, an argument for according representation to the colonies in the Assemblée Nationale de Situant, that was to write the Constitution for the Fourth Republic. In that assembly, the conception of France would become an argument for extending the quality of the citizen to people who, up to then, uh, and throughout the period described in Eric's book, were designated as subjects. The most interesting portions of Eric's book concern the people of, of ethnic Equatorial of Francaise. And come, what, whatever Africans thought of the allegiance their administrators decided for them, they would have to play a role in the war effort. Eric documents the escalation of coerced labor and rubber collection and gold mining, that the termination of the free French to use RF to contribute to allied capacities necessarily entail. To extensive archival sources about what was happening on the ground, he adds remarkable photographs by, by Germaine Cru and important testimonies from her on the ground experience as well as from the, uh, the letter de doléance of, uh, of some of the uh, African subjects. Uh, but the, the escalation of forced labor uh, was not uh, entirely colonial business as usual, although it certainly had its roots in a much longer period of the use of coerced labor in both West and Equatorial uh, Africa. But what's particularly interesting <coughs> here is what Felix Egwe himself and his right-hand man, Henri Laurenti, said about it. Uh, for them, they were ex extremely worried about the escalation of forced labor, which, which, which was one thing uh, when you're uh, running a, uh, a, a colony in uh, the time of peace, but another thing when you're escalating everything and intensifying everything and you're dealing with a wartime uh, situation. Uh, what their doubts focus on uh, was the potential uh, damage to, to the honor of France, to be, to be sure, but most especially to the disruption of family and village life that, uh, of, of Africans. Their views, especially those of Aigwe himself, are paternalistic with a view of an essential African peasantry and traditional life. Uh, but they developed a strong sense of the limits to which African societies would be, would be pushed. And this, this, this discourse was, was quite a strong one, uh, coming out of the very top of the very people who were in charge of uh, increasing the exports of uh, latex and of gold. Uh, Eric also points to the objections that René Cassin became an influential uh, jurist and figure in French politics and, a spoke, and, and somebody very much involved in a worldwide discourse about human rights after the war. Cassin, too, weighed in uh, with his doubts about the way in which the, the, uh, the, the unfreedom of free France was being exercised. But, but above all, what, what stands out in, in this discussion is the, is the phrase that, uh, that Eric cites from uh, the very top of the administration, that Afrique Equatoria Francaise was a bout de souffle, uh, later to become the title of a famous movie. Uh, but here we, 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 we see recognition of what a colonial state could and could not do. And one might note, that this recognition of being out the souffle came at a time when the total production and exports, you saw some of the statistics, were rather pathetic by the standards of other parts of the colonized world. Now, in his, in his comment, uh, Bob Paxton has been, uh, raised the question of, of a comparison with the, the IOF under Vichy rule, and that's quite an interesting one, too. For the, the, the argument that uh, OF uh, was at the limits of what it could do. It was also being made, and it was being made by none other than the, than the Vichy Governor General, uh, Pierre Boisson, uh, who repeatedly w w w was uh, tell telling his bosses in, 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 in Vichy uh, that, they, that they were disrupting African village and traditional life in a way. He was no uh, friend of the African. He was a, he was a brute. But he was worried about disorder. About disorder. He, th he thought it was dangerous to do this kind of thing. In, again, we're in a situation where the actual output 
of, 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 of ROF was, was, was rather pathetic. And little of it could actually be used by Vichy because of the Allied blockade. Uh, but the flip side of that was imported goods weren't coming into Ottawa because of the, of, the, of the blockade. And therefore, there was no incentive for Africans to do anything for the administration. And therefore, the only thing the administration could do to get anybody to work was to force them uh, to, to, to do so. Uh, so you're, 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 you're seeing some, these parallels are actually rather interesting. Now, Vichy had its fantasies, uh, which rather exceeded those, those that were uh, in, in Ottawa. You, you hold out, uh, had all these reports being, being written in Vichy about the rational organization of production, a uh, uh, real strong division of labor, which Africans, of course, would be doing all the dirty work. work. Uh, and a uh, uh, kind of dismissive note for anybody with moral scruples about what this uh, would involve. Vichy had its development plan, and, and, and used that word. But the development plan was never funded. It was never implemented. The whole thing was in the realm of fantasy. Uh, that here we could produce a kind of uh, of, uh, uh, of highly organized exploitative globalism in a wartime situation uh, in, in the context of this uh, struggle with a neighbor that was on uh, the, other, the other side. Uh, but, bo but both of the, uh, the Vichy IOF and the Free French uh, IOF were of the Uh And Boisson, the governor general was repeatedly reprimanded by his bosses in the Indici uh, for punctual, punching holes in the notion of, uh, of gradual exploitation and reminding uh, people that there really were limits to what colonial power uh, could do. So at the same time that you're seeing the importance of what could be done by a very small group of, the, of determined men in a colonial situation, you see a realization on the part of those men of the limits of what they could do. And that's an important point for thinking of what would come uh, next. Uh, the argument for progressive colonialism in 1944, that's the Conference de Brazzaville, began with the argument that Africans had been asked to do too much. Too much forced labor, too much forced cultivation, too high levels of taxation. Uh, and this, be this became uh, uh, an argument for uh, a certain kind of colonial reform, but certainly not a colonial ref uh, reform in the, in the direction uh, of Africans running the show uh, themselves. Indeed, uh, the, the uh, Roosevelt Conference decided that, that they had to give them, that much as everybody said forced labor in the future, they decided that they would give themselves five years to wean themselves from it. Apparently, the, the, the 70 previous years of education and value of work had not quite done the, the trick. Uh, but very much at, at Brazil is an argument of an essentially conservative, paternalistic conception of, of Africa, whose most notable spokesman was Fabius Ebuet. Maybe Africa was lucky that Ebuet died in 1944, uh, basically from lung disease caused by smoking too many cigarettes. Uh, for without such an eloquent spokesman, the conservative bent of this argument and indeed lost out to the more, to the, to the more uh, forward-looking views of some uh, new actors who are not as high-bound as Ebuet, uh, including somebody like, like Ari Berlanti, who is a significant character in, in, in Ebuet's book. But the most important new actors were not Muranti uh, or Robert Levignette, but people coming out of Africa. People like Lamine Gay and Leopold Sangor. Now the names I mentioned are two people from Senegal. And they entered the debate at the end of 1945. Now there were, in the, they, and they were deputies in the first Espinacion and Sichuan. Now there were deputies from RAF too. <coughs> but interestingly enough, they, they were much less influential uh, and much less forward than those coming from, by now, ex uh, uh RUF, with the exception of Gabriel Dabroussier, uh, elected from Congo Brazzaville, but his father was Franco-Francais and his mother was, was African. From recognition that RUF was out of breath, eventually came the argument that Africa needed breathing room. It had to have some voice, but certainly not an equal voice in the minds of officials in future political affairs. Uh, and a more development-oriented economic policy was needed, 
both for reconstruction of metropolitan France and for giving Africans some sense of a stake in an imperial future. Such an argument would become very quickly almost impossible to keep in the containers that its initial proponents at Brazzaville wanted to be. And in the course of, the, of this shift toward, toward, towards uh, giving African more breathing room, AOF became what it had been before the war, the poor sister of its West African neighbor, the extreme of colonial backwardness. Thank you. Um, I'm going to add a few comments of my own that's already new if you're not at this point of the world. Uh, and I know that you want to open up for the floor. I'm going to be very brief. Uh, just a few things I wanted to point out because I think much has already been said that that's of great, great value. Uh, and I don't have greater expertise in these questions than anyone else at the table, except that I was born on the anniversary of the Paris Declaration. <laughs> and I grew up along Boulevard de Gaulle in Algiers. Although that Algiers is along the Mississippi. I'll work it for what I can. So while we're talking about doing the memoir and whatnot, uh, I, have my, I have staked my claim. Um, and I said the declaration of the Clark's anniversary, but not which anniversary. The anniversary of the Not which anniversary of the I think the, the fascinating thing to me about the book, the important historiographical lesson from it, I think there are, are several. One thing that I took away from it, I think, that's important that I'd like to point out is it's really the realization of, of multi-sided and locating archival research across uh, across Africa and in France as well. And that, that is a, it's a very rare example of what maybe in previous generations or previous decades, years, might have been a kind of imperial history, but it, that it goes far beyond an imperial history and that it is in many ways uh, a history of an interlaced history uh, that has great lessons for, for the history of Africa and for the history of France and for the, uh, the, the shared history that we're unable to, to, to fully disentangle. And I think that needs to be pointed out. It's, it's clear in the footnotes, it's less clear perhaps in the discourse, maybe a little in the photo credits, the degree to which this book is really a realization of a particular vision of what the Francophone uh, history could be, and I want to just salute that. Um, the other thing I want to do is just walk the story forward a little bit as it pertains to Francophone Africa, uh, because there are also lessons here. There are effects for this story uh, on the anti-colonial movement of the 1940s and 50s, you know, part of which uh, you know, Professor Cooper has just gestured towards. And there are effects that go forward uh, from there, although they you know, remain to be fully kind of hashed out. In the anti-colonial movement, uh, this particular episode gives us more than simply metaphors of resistance and collaboration that resonate in powerful ways uh, through the 1940s and 50s. Um, it also helps us understand partly the way in which uh, even the, the post-free French kind of networks that remained in Francophone Africa resisted with great ferocity in the anti-colonial movements. Um, points out the degree to which the resistance being made in, in French Africa in the absence of the French Communist Party, which was so important for France itself, that resistance to the inter-territorial inter RDA movement, the great anti-colonial movement in the 1940s and 50s, was ferociously uh, pursued right through 1950 because of the alliance with the French Communist Party and metropolitan politics. Uh, it helps us understand, for, for, for myself, for example, that one of the one of the governors of of Sudan Francais, what would become Mali, uh, Nouveau, in the 1940s and 50s, had been a, a Gaullist of, of early days. Had spent time in, in prison in Monaco for that for that reason. And the prison cell in which he was he was kept would later bear his name, and many other political prisoners would pass through it in years to come. Some of them put here put there by himself, some of them put there by his successors. Um, but the, the effects on the anti-colonial movement were, were clear and go beyond metaphors. There's also the question of the story that's told in this book demonstrates the very high stakes for decolonization, as Professor Paxton was pointing to, which the Free French folk were particularly aware of, and acutely aware of the high stakes for decolonization. The intensification of extraction in the 1940s was mirrored across the Congo River in, in Belgian Congo as well. Both the Belgians and the French, and indeed to a different degree, the English and the British were very aware of what decolonization might cost them, that the war had, had underscored the value of empire rather than the contrary. Um, and the book itself, uh, Eric Jennings' book, serves as something of a bridge between this, what was till now a fairly hazy episode of the Free French in Africa, 
and the continued importance in the 1940s, 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s of the free French networks in Franco-African politics. That if French, if La France Libre Foot Africaine, what was France Afrique, if not, in some sense, an outcome of the free French networks, that the, the réseau of France, of France Afrique, the, the Chevy Foucault network uh, with its uh, official positions, uh, with a great deal of unofficial power, was very much an outgrowth of the free French movement, that people like Pierre Messmier and Etty de Bois-Lambert, who exercised great influence in high politics in the 1950s and 60s, who partly constructed, although they didn't play such a role in, in, a, in a France Afrique phenomenon as Foucault himself, of course, did. They were central to it, but so were people like Fernand Dubois and others, who were key to the way that France Afrique would unfold in decades to come. So if we take Eric Jennings' book as something of a bridge between this very important moment, what happens in the anti-colonial period of the 40s and the 50s, and that, that kind of politics, that shouldn't characterize the whole period as anti-colonial, but in that moment of politics, and then leap forward or move forward uh, into the post-colonial period, understand the kind of networks of power that continue to prevail, in, particularly in equatorial Africa, that we, understand, we see the irony of the fact that those countries that were the most deeply engaged in the Free France episode would also be the most deeply affected and wound into uh, the France Afrique network that followed the war and that lasted right through at least the 1990s and the death of Foucault. So those are the comments that I wanted to make, but I want to turn the floor over to you. If you had any great responses, or if you'd like to put the floor general. Which I do. <laughs> I'm tempted to respond on the four points very briefly, but I also want people to have a chance to ask questions. Should the job be extremely brief? Okay. Uh, thank you for those wonderful uh, comments. Uh, on the crushing of dissent, uh, Robert Paxson, you're absolutely correct. I, I should have gone into more detail on that. Um, there, I just wanted to mention that it was quite ferocious. And then uh, the Free French really overreacted at anything that might hint of Germanophilia, for instance, in Cameroon, which had once been a German colony, right? So there's this massive overreaction. And in, even in cases like Congo, this overreaction involves, for instance, the jailing of André Matsua, uh, who becomes a kind of martyr who dies in jail and then a millinerist uh, religion develops around Matsua. And really, uh, his persecutor, his tormentor, is seen locally to have been Fuji Sibui and Shah de Gaulle. There's a whole uh, story about the sort of resistance to the resistance that needs to be told that I only can tell in the book. The whitening of the army is something that I go into great detail in the book, but just didn't have time to raise. But you're right, it's staggered. And I've described two distinctive whitening moments, one in the summer of 43 and one in 44. Uh, I just wanted to mention very quickly that almost fortuitously, a handful of original Free French African units, from Cameroon in particular, managed to survive this whitening, the M4 and the VM5, and I devote a few pages to them. And they managed to fight their way through Italy and then all the way to Provence, and in one case, all the way to the Vosges. So there are a handful of exceptions. Um, I also wanted to mention that that whitening is almost systematically coded geoclimatically, which is to say, the pretext is these African troops can't take the winter in Europe. Um, I wanted to mention in response to, to Fred's point uh, that it's almost a kind of Shakespearean tragedy, the way in which Lomancy and Igwe realize that their dream of avoiding proletarization in Africa is, is being destroyed on their clock. Uh, there's something deeply tragic. They realize that they are achieving precisely the reverse of what they need to achieve. And in a sense, the Brazzaville Conference is almost a compensatory effort because of that tragedy. Um, and, and this goes back to your point uh, in, your, in your book on, on decolonization, that really there isn't that much that separates Bledsoe from the Greek. I even have popular voices saying those two are inseparable. They have the same policies. Um, and, and this is confirmed by the rather jaded outlook of Vichy spies at the Brazzaville Conference, who look at this and say, there's nothing new here. This is the same sort of thing we've been doing in West Africa for years. Uh, so there are synergies there as well, and you're right to, to stress them. And, and just like Robert, you were right to stress the incredible reactionary nature of some of these free French. I do try to clump them into two clusters. There's a sort of, you know, the die-hard anti-republicans and then the slightly more open-minded ones, but even so. And then a final point about memory. Um, I, I just wanted to suggest that, of course, this memory gets instrumentalized in Africa. It also gets instrumentalized and uh, manipulated in, in France. Uh, so this is a buvard that a French schoolchild would have had in the post-war. Well, all of these tirailleurs are lumped in together when, in fact, you know, most of these tirailleurs were out of the war for the five years, specifically the Yangushima, right? Indochina was essentially, for all intents and purposes, out of the conflict from 40 to 45. 
up, I wanted to mention the incredible mythology around Kufa. This is a little bit of the soil of Kufa, conservative but military uh, uh, museum in Fréjus. And then these incredible divisions, these sort of, these, these incredible um, blind spots. Uh, for instance, this remarkable poster for uh, an exhibit on how France was liberated by its colonies suddenly does away with the Mediterranean. And you have uh, the first battles of the Free French being waged from Sub-Saharan Africa, making their way through Kufra, all the way to the fetish that Professor Paxton mentioned, which is, of course, the liberation of Strasbourg and its uh, cathedral, which takes us full circle. Thank you.